20 years ago, it was just an idea, a grouping of emerging countries, all with large populations and impressive growth rates, banding together to rival the world's wealthiest and most industrialized nations. Two decades later, a lot of those predictions have come true. Formed back in 2006, the BRICS countries comprise Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And now the group says it is looking to expand for the first time in 12 years when it admitted South Africa back in 2010. The leaders of BRICS meet regularly to address a host of issues from funding infrastructure projects to providing liquidity support and protection during times of global financial pressure. The group also has at its disposal a multilateral development bank that many analysts have called a rival to the Western-dominated World Bank. Tens of billions of dollars in loans have been issued to member states to fund transport, energy and agricultural projects. But many have raised questions of how effective BRICS will be in the long term, given Russia's growing isolation over its attack on Ukraine and China's tense relationship with fellow member India. So just how big is BRICS and how does it compare to groups like the G7, which has been one of the bedrocks of Western influence in the world for several decades? The bloc has a combined nominal GDP of over 23 trillion US dollars. That is slightly less than the size of the G7, which stands at just under 34 trillion. The BRICS countries have a combined population of 3.2 billion people, which is over 40% of the world's total. That is nearly four times bigger than the G7. And the five BRICS states created the New Development Bank in 2014 to provide funds for infrastructure projects. Many have called it a serious rival to the IMF and World Bank. As of December 31, 2020, the NDB increased its net project approvals to $24 billion. And to discuss what an expansion of BRICS could mean, joining me now from Ankara is Oktay Tanrusevar. He is a professor of international relations at the Middle East Technical University and from Singapore. Raffaello Pantucci, he is a senior associate fellow at RUSI, a defense and security think tank. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program, Oktay. It's been 12 years since BRICS admitted a new member. There are a lot of eager candidates, but which country would have the best odds of, of joining? Uh, I think the uh, non-members of uh, G7, but members of uh, G20, uh, could uh, be part of them uh, because um, the developing countries, uh, which have great potential of contributing to global economy, uh, but uh, uh, excluded from G7, are likely to join this grouping. Uh, we have a MICTA group, uh, which is separate from BRICS. I think MICTA group and uh, uh, BRICS uh, might uh, join forces together uh, to uh, operate more effectively in global economy. So, um, Rafaela, what has you think pushed BRICS to expand further? I think it's a number of issues. Uh, I think it's very clear that, you know, the driving force uh, in terms of countries that are pushing this expansion is China and Russia. Um, and I think China and Russia at the moment both definitely see themselves as locked in a you know, struggle against the West and have been very keen to try to boost what they would offer as alternative structures, uh, you know, that compete against what they interpret as Western driven on the international stage. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the, you know, what used to be the G8 shrunk to become the G7, shedding Russia, showing their kind of ostracization from that group. We've seen NATO expanding now or looking to expand, uh, which is seen as competitive to Russia and increasingly seen as competitive to China. Um, you know, and so I think what we're seeing here is really China and Russia showing, well, we have options too. You know, we have institutions on the world stage that others want to come and join that reflect very much more our worldview on the world stage. Yeah, but also India seems eager to uh, see this organization expand further. So Oktai Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin said they look forward to more like-minded partners joining this organization. What type of criteria you think they are looking for when it comes to new members? I think this is the difficult part because um, the like-mindedness uh, doesn't exist even within BRICS uh, because Big countries have different orientations towards global economy, uh, but uh, probably um, China emphasizes 
the importance of um, uh, the new members, our new members accepting the fact that uh, these uh, BRICS countries could play a greater role in international economic system. Uh, so uh, these new members uh, should uh, align their, I mean, from the Chinese perspective, should align their trade policies and the global economic strategy uh, closer with the um, Yes. Uh, that of China. So, Rafael, uh, following the U.S.'s partial disengagement from the Middle East, our countries like the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, uh, who were all traditional Western allies, are now looking to other multilateral groups like BRICS. I mean, I think the point is that countries like options. You know, no country likes to see itself as locked into one specific grouping. And I think one of the key lessons we've seen over the past few years is that there is a desire for this kind of multi-alignment. Um, I mean, India is a very good example of this. You know, India, in some contexts, like contexts like the Quad uh, or in confrontations with China, is very much pushing a sort of line of it's very close to the West. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we can see that India is very active participant in BRICS. It's been an active participant in the past in the Russia-India-China grouping. It's a very active participant in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization which are all multilateral institutions that are much closer to China and Russia. And we can see that their relationship with Russia is one that very much competes or you know, contests in many ways with the re close relationship that they have uh, with the West and other contexts. So I think all of these countries have similar sorts of issues. So while the Saudis may you know, get along with the United States on some issues, they disagree on others. And I think what we're really seeing is a kind of is a desire to try to uh, you know, reshape the world. And this is not particularly new because you know, we've had for some time complaints from parts of the world that weren't necessarily sort of there at the table when, you know, the Bretton Woods agreements were signed or when, you know, we saw the sort of post-Cold World War, yeah. you know, definition of the world structure come together. They now would like to assert themselves. They're much more powerful. They're much larger countries now. They don't see why they should be sort of relegated and seen as sort of secondary mm -hmm. powers on the world stage. And so we're very keen to engage in any structure which elevates. Mm -hmm. Now I wonder where does Tur Turkey uh, stand? Oktay, Turkish President Erdogan uh, voices aspiration to make Turkey a full-fledged member of this organization back in 2018. But during that time, the organization was not planning to expand. What's the latest in your opinion? I mean, what does Turkey's membership stand? Would BRICS countries um, support its bid to join, you think? Uh, I think Tur uh, Turkey is already a member of MiGTA. Uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, uh, Turkey, and uh, uh, Australia grouping. Um, uh, so it could uh, broaden its um, uh, um, membership uh, by joining this group as well. Uh, but Turkey's main trading partners are in the EU. Uh, so uh, I think if Turkey joins this uh, BRICS grouping, uh, probably uh, it will make sure that uh, this will not harm its relations with the EU and uh, it will serve its broader interest in diversifying its uh, trade partners yes. uh, and uh, having global reach. So, Rafaela, what's your take on that? I mean, what would Turkey joining the BRICS mean for the Western alliance and as well as NATO? Is Turkey's um, NATO membership an obstacle before that, you think? Um, I don't particularly think so, because I think one of the things that's very clear is that, you know, what I think that um, uh, the sort of vision that is offered by these other structures, which are not maybe Western driven, is very much to say we are part of a different world. We are part of a new world that is non-exclusive. And so I think there is a desire to make sure that they aren't, you know, seeing themselves as institutions that, you know, won't let members in, um, members who sort of pay their dues, do the right things, you know, play the role and participate at the level that they would like, that the institution expects them to. You know they will, uh, you know they will let them in. So I don't think they would see something like NATO membership as a hindrance. Okay. Um, I think we can look. Yeah. Continue, please. No, sorry. I, I think you know you can look at how uh, you know other institutions have sort of come together and, and been willing to accept new members. And we've always seen that these sorts of organisations are eager to grow. And I think what they're trying to say in some ways is that we are willing to grow, unlike some of the old institutions. So if we think about the UN Security Council, yeah. for example. This is something that the India has wanted to join for a very long time. There's lots of other countries that would like to join it, but it has stayed a very exclusive club. Mm -hmm. And so I think these new institutions are trying to say, to say to the world, we aren't like this old. We are a representative of a new world. So within that context, I don't think you'd see Turkey being sort of 
offered an exclusion because of its NATO membership. Actually, I think they would say, well, this is a key selling point for us. You know, we don't exclude people, unlike these other ones. So in 2014, BRICS formed their own bank called the New Development Bank, uh, Octai. Billions Mm -hmm. of dollars have already been loaned out, and many are calling it a rival to the Western institutions like World Bank. So will this bank become a serious rival to Western-led institutions, or it is too early to say? Um, Yes, it has potential to be a major rival, but uh, as you said, um, global uh, economic financial system is uh, so complex. I mean, by simply increasing the financial um, uh, power of uh, BRICS, it may not uh, really transform global financial system, but it is something new. It could be very attractive for developing countries which find it difficult to borrow money from international financial markets. Uh, So many countries uh, would prefer to uh, work with this uh, bank. So, Rafael, if BRICS financial institutions expand further, could it create an alternative financial system that would be immune to Western sanctions and render Western-dominated rules ineffective? I think we're a long way from that, if I'm honest with you. I mean, if we talk about the BRICS Bank specifically, I think it's got a, a, a total market capitalization of around 50 billion. Whereas if we look at the IMF, I think it's circled somewhere around 500 billion. Um, so we're talking of institutions that are still very young, have a long way to go before they can grow and have the capacity to do the kind of lending and have the kind of financial firepower that the kind of more traditional institutions like the IMF or the World Bank have. So I think we're a long way off from that. The other thing to say about sanctions is, the force and power of sanctions isn't so much about, you know, about the sort of all the worlds that they create. It's really the fact that, you know, sanctions will stop people accessing um, the United States, uh, you know, capital markets. It will stop them using dollars. It will stop them, you know, from accessing what are the wealthiest parts of the world and remain the wealthiest parts of the world by a real a long margin. You know, the alternative currencies that people talk about that could sort of fill in with that would be the Chinese one, for example. But, you know, for the Chinese to be able to compete with the dollar and therefore be able to offer an alternative structure on the world stage to the sort of dollar economy or even the euro economy, you know, the Chinese would have to basically let their currency float a lot more freely. And they would have to essentially lose a lot of the control that they currently have on it, which would have all sorts of repercussions at home, which they're not going to let happen. So we're a long way off from these institutions really creating an alternative worldview. But what I think we can confidently say is that is the direction that they would like to be seen to be going in. But I think we're a long way from that reality okay. actually becoming uh, coming to be coming to pass. All right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.